Let's start with the top rotor. What you see here on the screen is the final result, what we want to achieve. You can see that the blades are broken into medium-sized pieces and then connected with glue constraints, which means that if a blade hits a ground or a building, we will allow it to break off. And here we have a very important constraint, the pink one that you see is connected to the base of the rotor. Remember, we created uh, this, we isolated this piece and put it in a separate group earlier because we will use this piece to control our rotation. Please note that everything that you see here in terms of constraints is created in a SOP workflow. Uh, it is really simple, straightforward, and it's working, working perfectly fine. So let's get started and see how we can achieve that. On top, you can see a node called split front rotor. Uh, let's look what we have here. I'm going to just disable my material so that it's easier for me to see the pieces. And then first thing, we are going to isolate our base and fix a few intersections. It is very important before you fracture your geometry that you examine it and see if you have any interpenetration happening. If I template my base and look at the bottom, you will see that there is actually an intersection with the part, with the part of the uh, blades that you see in gray. Especially in our case, when those blades and this uh, gray part is going to be rotating and moving around, we need to fix those intersections intersections, otherwise it's not going to work for us. So I'm using a simple boolean here to do this fix. And uh, very often I feel that this is a part that is overlooked, that people start fracturing their geometry before examining it properly. Uh, please, in general, spend your time. I find it rather meditative just to turn on some music and spend some time examining the geometry and fixing those small uh, intersections. After that, we're bringing back everything together. The base we will treat it separately in a moment, but right now let's go and fracture our blades. As usual, first I'm adding a polyfill here in case we have some holes in the geometry to fix them. And then I'm splitting the central part and the blades. So let's go and see how our blades are fractured. There is another polyfill here. If you look at it, it fixed some of the holes of the geometry. And then we are doing a pretty usual workflow where I will scatter some points on the blades and then I will add some cutters on those points. Of course, I want to add some random orient attribute on them so that when the cutters are copied, they are positioned uh, with random rotations. And here an important point is I want to make sure that I delete my UV attribute because when the points were copied on the blades, they, by default, they inherit a UV attribute. And we do not want that. We want the UVs to come from the cutters themselves so that when we have our inside uh, part of the geometry, it has proper UVs on it. I will demonstrate it to you in a second. Then we have our grid. We remesh it. We project some UVs onto it. And we create a mountain node. After that, we copy our cutters onto the Point. So if I look here at my UV quick shade, and uh, sometimes I notice there is a, maybe it is a bug, maybe it's something that is happening with my machine. Let me see if I can view things. Yeah, okay, sometimes uh, this visualizer doesn't work properly. I need to right click on it and I need to select either gray or UV color. But what I noticed is sometimes something happens during copy to points and UVs do not get uh, copied properly. In that case, I figured out a small hack how to fix it. If you find a better solution, please let me know. But what I'm doing is I am promoting my UVs from uh, vertices to points. And after I do copy to points, I promote them back. In that case, definitely uh, it is then working. But right now it's working for us, so I don't really need this. But just so that you know, if you're checking the UVs and you're not seeing anything in here, like, for example, right now, oh no, it is working. Like, for example, if you don't see anything here in the viewport, your UVs are not showing, you can enable those nodes and it will fix it for you. After that, we're doing a Boolean. 
And if you see, now my blades are fractured into pieces. Let's double check that our UVs are working and the materials are applied properly. Sometimes I noticed I need to bypass material, uh, quick lapse quick material and enable it again. What we have here is our blades with our texture applied properly. And here we have our inside faces that got the UVs from the cutters. So we actually have a texture on the inside part. And you will notice here, here I'm doing a little bit of a transform on only on the inside part of the fracture so I can have more detail. This is an artistic choice. This is up to you. You can also just create a separate texture that you want to add there. But I know in my shot, everything is moving super fast. The blades are quite far from the camera. And if I have a little bit of a detail on the inside, there are metal blades, stuff got broken. You can see some circuits, some metal parts. I would think that it will add a tiny bit of uh, interesting details. So I'm gonna leave it here. After that, I'm creating a separate group just for those blades so that later I can um, easily access them and I'm merging them back with the central portion. Let me disable my material so it's easier for you to see. After that, uh, I'm creating the name attribute. Now you have rotor from 0 to 574. If you look at the exploded view, these are my uh, top rotor pieces. Then what I do is I manually isolate a part, this top part, and I give it a name called rotator. Why do I do that? Is because we will use this uh, rotator as a pivot point to animate the rotation of the blades. So simply I'm using my name attribute and I'm just adding a word rotator to the end of the name. Then I'm grouping my front rotor and front rotor rotator. That's it. And earlier we created a group front rotor base. I want to remove it from this geometry because base is separated from it. This is just a housekeeping cleanup process. After that, this is our base. We bring it back. We create a name for it, front rotor base. Adding it to a separate group and deleting a group front rotor. This way we have a properly named groups. We have front rotor, front rotor brace, we have the blades, everything is here. And we are saving the name into a name original attribute. After that, the usual, we're doing convex decomposition of all the pieces and uh, grouping everything in a group called rotor and caching it. Uh, you can see in my case, it was a fifth version of the cache. So if you are following along, you want to cache it yourself, please change the version and cache it on your system. Before we move on, I always like to double check that whatever fracture I created, that the logic is going to work for me in the simulation. So let's pressure test our logic. So I'm doing an RBD unpack. And first constraint that I want to create is the constraint between this uh, top uh, rotor. We have the front rotor rotator. If you click on it, you see this is the front rotor rotator and then front rotor base. So we're constraining these two with a simple line. And after that, we are converting this line. Let me just zoom in a little bit and then show you what it converted to. We're converting it into a point, this little point here in the center. So I'm just creating my, uh, selecting my constraint and uh, transforming it into a single point. And this is what will control our rotation. And after that, I'm setting property to this constraint. It will be a con hard constraint uh, with position only, which means that this part of the rotor will try to stay where it is relative to the other piece, but we will keep, uh, will allow it to rotate. That's uh, the main logic here. After that, I'm creating constraints on the rest of the pieces that we broke. And for this test, I am just giving them strength of minus one because I want to test the rotational part of the logic. So the blades, they stay um, intact. Then we are doing our RBD configure. And in the RBD configure, there are two things that we need to set up. First, we have our front rotor base, this base, and it is a non-active uh, object. It is only animated. What we will do, we'll just create 
animation on it and see if the rest of the part, uh, rest of the uh, rotor is rotating around it. And on the front rotor part, this one, we are allowing it to be animated for three frames after the solver starts, but after that it will turn animated off and we will turn active on. You see that active and animated are linked and they're opposite of each other. So whenever animated changes, active is going to be the opposite. So for three frames, it's going to be animated and not active, and then they're going to switch. It's going to stop being animated and will become active. Let's see how it works in action. Uh, before that, first let's add the rotation. So I'm adding a RVD transform here, where I'm simply rotating the rotor, I'm animating the rotation, and I'm using this front rotor base. Remember we said we need to isolate front rotor base, this guy here, this base, I'm creating a center pivot of it, and this is what I will use as a pivot for the rotation. So I have this point here in the center, and I'm using this point as a pivot in my RBD transform. Here you can see it's used as a pivot, and then I have a simple expression here for the rotor rotation. And then I'm transforming it a little bit more uh, sideways so that it's uh, uh, not completely flat because I want to double check that the blades are not going to slide down and they're going to st uh, stay attached to the base. So let's go to the first frame, turn on our bullet solver, and see if everything is working. We have our rotation. The blades are rotating around the base, even though they are in, um, not on a flat surface, everything is still working. So if I play again, yes, I see there is some part that is flying away, but I'm not going to get concerned about that yet. It means maybe one of the constraints was not long enough and some piece got away. Let's just keep it in mind and we'll fix it later when we work on the final constraints for the actual final simulation. But now your rotor is working, your logic of the rotation is working, we are ready to move on.